Hey y'all, welcome back to Chasing Dreams Homestead. So this next video is another video from our Spring Homesteaders meet and greet. Uh, Leslie Joe Frazier from Celtic Glen Homestead came down and gave a class on rabbits. We hope you enjoy her class. And if you have any follow-up questions after watching the class, feel free to comment them and we'll get them to her. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Leslie Lennon. I'm with Celtic Glen Heritage Livestock. So we're, uh, we're a small farm up in the Spencer Bloomington, just a little bit north of here. And um, on our farm, we, we specialize in heritage breeds, and uh, we start with things that eat grass and not each other mostly, like rabbits, goats, sheep, cat, small cattle, highlands, and dexters. So today I'm going to talk to you about rabbits, and I really am excited about rabbits because I think they're sort of the most practical kinds of stock for a homesteader. Um, that, and there's something that people can do on any scale, which is also really unusual. And they're really quiet. So unlike chickens or, right, they're very quiet animals. So this is an advantage that they have. And so um, the purposes of rabbits on a homestead, even if you don't, even if you're a vegetarian, keep a rabbit for fertilizer. And so that's the propaganda I've sent around is information about rabbit, um, rabbit berries as fertilizer. So it's a 211 for your garden, very mild. It's a cold fertilizer, meaning you don't have to compost it. You can put it straight onto your plants. You can you can use it as a side dressing throughout your growing season. I make um, so I, I dry out the berries and put them in these little pouches. You can make a, a tea with them for your house plants. I'll pass it around. You'll see it doesn't smell like anything. It's very neutral. So um, so if you if you take away anything from this is that if you grow food for yourself, get at least a pet rabbit. Some people, you can litter box train them. <laughs> so if, if, if you, even if you don't want to do rabbits as meat, think about a rabbit as a source of fertilizer for your, for your homestead. One rabbit will make an actual ton of material in one year. So if you do rabbits for meat, you're going to have a lot of this stuff anyway. You might as well grow tomatoes. <laughs> so so th this is a really important feature of rabbits for all homesteaders. It has to do with fertilizer. You shouldn't have to be buying commercial chemical fertilizers. You can produce your own fertilizer. So rabbits is meat. Rabbits are a fantastic source of lean protein. So three ounces of rabbit meat is 56% of your RDA for protein. Just three ounces. Now nobody eats three ounces of meat at one time. And we're so fortunate that you have rabbit barbecue today so you can try some. But what I would say about rabbit meat if you haven't tried it is to make it in a way that you already like. So if you like like pulled pork sandwiches, get your rabbit and your sauce, tacos or a noodle soup, make it in a way you already know you like to give it a fair chance. And think of it as maybe a little bit more like turkey, a little bit stronger flavor. Um, and <clears throat> so very, very lean, very, very lean protein and high quality protein for your family. The other thing about rabbits is you can raise them year round. Now your, your biggest challenge, as with most of your stock is gonna, in this area, is gonna be that heat. That humid heat in July and August is gonna be, um, think rabbits like to live underground. It's 50 degrees all the time. So, but that said, winter is not your problem. Just like with chickens, cold is not a problem. You don't need to heat them. You need to give, you need lots of ventilation. So Chase was just talking about ventilation. This is the main problem on modern homesteads, especially with those beautiful pole barns. They don't have enough air. So you need lots of ventilation without drafts. So don't worry about the cold. You can produce all winter long. You can produce rabbit meat and breed your rabbits. Those deep, hot, humid summer days are gonna be harder. They may need some support. So ceramic tiles, maybe some frozen water bottles or um, fans. Or if you want to, you might wanna put your buck in your basement because bucks over 80 degrees can become temporarily sterile, but it'll last several months. So that if you're gonna spoil anybody, spoil your bucks, spoil your boys, um, and, and think about the basement. But other than that, you don't have to, rabbits are very um, temperature neutral. So um, I'm gonna talk about a number of things. Let's talk about like deciding, okay, I'm interested in rabbits. What do I want? If, as I said, if it's just for fertilizer for your garden, you can get the most ridiculous little thing and you're gonna have tons of fertilizer. <laughs> if it's for meat protein, a good source of protein for your family, you're gonna wanna stick with things that they call the standard meat breeds. And those are adult sizes of nine to 12 pounds. 
I would avoid anything giant unless you just love them. If you love those big giant dog-sized rabbits, okay, fine. You can eat those too. That's fine. But otherwise, if you don't, stay in that range because otherwise you're feeding bone. You're growing a lot of bone. And if you stay within that, and if you get something that's a lot smaller, it's, you're gonna, it's gonna take you a lot of time and more feed to get that same, same amount of meat. The only exceptions are a couple of small breeds that are very practical for homesteads. Those would be Dutch rabbits and Florida whites. Florida whites are extremely efficient. It takes a cup of feed a day for a Florida white versus, no, a half a cup, sorry, versus a whole cup for a regular meat breed. And you get the same amount of, wheat, of meat with two more weeks of growth. So you can do the math, it's really efficient. And they have very little bone to meat ratio. So I really encourage people to think about Florida whites. Also, they don't need quite as much space. So you can get away with a little bit smaller cages. So Florida whites are a great breed. Uh -huh. No, not not particularly. The the breed that you can think about if you um, if you have an outdoor rabbit tree, you can think about a kind of rabbit that was developed by Texas A and M University called Tamex. And all Texas A and M did is they took New Zealand the New Zealand breed and they selected for longer ears and thinner fur. So the ears are the air conditioner. The surface area of the ear is how they release the heat, and they have a little bit thinner fur. And so we also, we raise those. They come in like a commercial variety and in a smorgasbord variety for homesteaders that they call composites. And they'll, each litter will have a whole bunch of colors and things. So they're kind of fun for homesteaders. Here's the other consideration. When you think about rabbits and you think about getting some stock, think about what are my goals? If my goals are fertilizer and meat for my family, then pretty much any rabbit will do. If you also want to have other income streams or if your kids want to show in 4-H or do things like that, you need a you need an actual breed that's recognized by the American Rabbit Breeder Association. And there's so many to choose from. If you go on the Livestock Conservancy website, they have a lovely comparison chart where you can find out about a whole bunch of really cool heritage breeds. Heritage breeds of animals help, pr help um, promote biodiversity. Biodiversity is interesting not only because we like variety and variety is really nice, but also because if a new disease comes along, somebody will survive the new disease. This is the, the main point why we want to not lose these um, farm breeds that we used to have so many different varieties of. So, um, so you can, there's lots of breeds that will work for you. Enjoy, find something that you like and, and enjoy um, working with the animal. Okay, anything else about selecting a rabbit? And I'm gonna show you a rabbit and talk about what you need to do in terms of thinking about, I mean, we can go ahead and do that now. Um, when you purchase a, an animal. Okay, these are These are a, an American, it's an important part of American culture. These are a breed called American Blues and Whites. The, I raised these and also Silver Fox. And these are both breeds that were developed in the United States um, or the early part of the 20th century for dual purpose, for meat and for pelt. Before we started wearing petroleum products, we wore animals, <laughs> animal products. Um, so um, they are an ex these are an extremely friendly breed. So that's why I brought them because they show well. They like, they like the public. Okay, when you're gonna purchase an animal, you're looking for general signs of health. So this goes really well with Chase's talk just now. You're looking for clean noses, you don't want to see mucus, right? Because respiratory and digestive tract problems are the main killers for most animals, right? For most stock. You're going to look in their ears. You're looking that they look clean, that you're not seeing ear mites. If they have ear mites, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker because ear mites, they're easy to kill. A few days dousing with mineral oil smothers them. And you can use mineral oil routinely with your rabbits to prevent ear mites. So when you breed them, just put a couple drops of mineral oil down in their ears and that'll help keep the ear mites down. You're looking at their ears. You're looking at their general, do they look alert? Do they look bright, alert? So you trust your instincts. If an animal looks, uh, now they're all gonna be scared because <laughs> probably when you're, you're holding them and you're taking them out and stuff, but it should look healthy to you and you can trust your instincts on that. Um, the other thing we're gonna look for with rabbits, if you're breeding for show rabbits, 
you're gonna get uh, there's like a one page description for each breed about the things that they that will disqualify an animal for showing or not things like a white toenail so you're gonna kind of look at those elements once you decide and you pick your breed you're also gonna look at their teeth when they're young rabbits this guy is just like nine weeks old when they're young rabbits they're not going to have broken teeth but an older breeder might have broken teeth and that's not going to be very useful because they'll have trouble eating well with young rabbits you're looking to see that the teeth that they have a slight overbite but that otherwise their teeth are pretty straight and there isn't like a crazy long tooth you can you can file them and clip them if the teeth are weird but who's going to do that right like just pick good stock to start with and you certainly want to don't want to breed that trait in your rabbits so you're gonna look at the teeth. So I will just kind of whiz by and then later I can show you guys if you want to see things in more detail. But you're just kind of looking like this. Can I, am I teasing them? Oh, shortly, but yes. <laughs> yeah. So you're just kind of kind of hold up their teeth and you're gonna kind of look and see and they should just look like cute little, little bunnies. Yeah, can you guys kind of see? Yeah, and then um, we're gonna, so we've looked at those things and then we're going to, everybody wants to know, do we have boys or girls? So let's talk about sexing the rabbits. When they're really little, it is really hard. It's really, and you can, you can be sure that something was a boy and it turns out to be a girl later. So, so it can be, it can be challenging. There's a whole Facebook page, which is sexing bunnies and you can put pictures of your rabbits and people will help you. When we first started, we would take pictures of the parts and we put them on the big screen TV and like vote. Like, are we looking at boys or girls? But once you get used to it, it's a lot easier. And as they get bigger, it's much easier. Uh, because of course, as they mature, their organs become more prominent. So before I do that, I'm gonna say a couple words about picking up a rabbit. One thing you'll notice is I've got his rear tucked. Rabbits have incredibly powerful hind legs and they can break their own backs. And then you have to dispatch if they pick because they'll be paralyzed. So you have to you have to keep them from kicking. So you have to tuck that rear under so that they can't kick. So however you hold the rabbit, you protect the back when you're picking it up. Um, so I've got the rabbit here on the table. You kind of okay. So here's the rabbit. This is kind of like the, a little bit of the show posture here, so you can kind of see their form. As you get better at rabbits, you'll get better at picking out what's gonna um, be the best way to. Um, see that they have the kind of deep production qualities you want. When you pick them up, you can kind of scoop them underneath if they're little. If they're not, you can kind of go like this with your arm and scoop them up. You want to think of them like a little football, either holding your face forward or tucked back with the arm like this. So you want to think about, I've got that rear immobilized here. Okay, so that's important thing about picking them up and holding them. Now we're going to talk about sexing. So I'm going to flip him over. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so they nurse upside down like this. So this is actually a fairly comforting position for them. They're like, he's pretty relaxed now. And the thing about sexing the rabbit is that you want to actually apply a fair amount of pressure because you want those organs to kind of be very visible. And so they talk about our, um, and when you're, oh, when you're buying the rabbit, you're also gonna look that they're clean because you don't want digestive problems. So you don't want signs that they've been sick or that they're going to be sick. So you don't want, you want this area to be clean. And you're gonna press down fairly firmly so that the area is very exposed. And so they talk about tacos versus burritos. So the boys are gonna be your burritos. It's gonna be, it's gonna kind of pop up and be very circular. The females are gonna look more like, uh, more like a taco and gonna have a less distance between the, the reproductive organs and the anus. So I will kind of do this, but I'm happy to do it later when there's, if you guys just want me to practice with you. So this is a girl, a girl. And again, when they're older, this is way easier. It's going to be really obvious. We can pet, we can also pet later, okay? When you're getting started, two people, and when they're little and super squirmy, two people. When they're with rat, when you're working with your rabbits, it's this. It's the girl. Um, they have little 
sharp claws. If you just have like two does in a buck, you can clip their toenails with cat nail clippers. And I, but I don't have time for this. So I either am in a hurry and I get scratched up or it's winter and I've got a nice fleece on. If it's summer, I'll wear a heavy canvas apron so I don't get my chest scratched up. You can use rose trimming gloves. You can use barbecue gloves to protect those forearms. But it is hard when they're little and they're very squirmy and so forth. But you'll get better at it, I promise. Okay, so we'll find a boy. Let's see, I need a boy volunteer. Hi. Just because they're a fairly friendly breed, that they're so <laughs> Well, both. Both the breed okay. matters in terms of disposition. Uh, Americans are super people oriented. Um, I have an Angora, and she's the moodiest thing I've ever Yeah. Seen. Sometimes your females are going to be more subject to hormonal changes, and they like they like being bred, so they want to keep them bred. But um, yeah, so um, if you handle them more, they'll be calmer, but a breed matters too. So let me see what, if I've got a boy here. And if I don't, we may just have to come back to the boys. No. Well, because then they're not squirming, but also they don't. What they don't see is less scary. So rabbits are prey animals, and this is this is, determines a lot of their behavior. So here's a big one for you. I, I sold a rabbit to a lady once, and I checked in with her later and said, "How's she doing?" She goes, "Oh, she's not a good mother. I'm just going to have to cull her." And I said, "Really? What is she doing?" She doesn't pay attention to her kids. And I'm like, oh my gosh, lady, they're not people. They, they're prey animals. So the best way a mother can protect her babies is to leave them alone. So they just nurse maybe twice a day. Rabbits are most active in the morning and in the evening. How often do you refund babies in yards with no mom present? And it's not, and mom's doing what she's supposed to. She's getting out of there so she doesn't attract a predator to eat the whole nest. So it's a survival mechanism that they don't particularly now that doesn't mean I, I, you know, some does I have are very into it. And they like to cuddle and they like to, as their babies get older. It's not that. It's just I'm saying you got to remember that they're, they're, they're not us. They are other. They're another species. So, and and a lot of their behavior is conditioned by the fact that they're prey animals. So, when you're thinking about starting your rabbitry, uh, it's very helpful to have two does because it's helpful to breed them at the same time. If tragedy strikes, it's good to have a foster mother because they can take on more kids and nurse them out. The kids, it's important for them to nurse. If they're under three, three weeks, then you're going to have a hard time keeping them alive. You'll have to get the little kitten droppers and yeah, it's like really hard. If they're three weeks old, they're probably going to live without mom. You just any, any time that you have a, a stressful situation, just go to hay, hay and water. Um, normally, I just use hay for um, stressful situations to put in a nest box or um, if um, as a treat. Otherwise, I don't bother with hay because it's a big mess and you really want to keep the that keep the space clean. So, so um, the hay can be a really um, <laughs> a great way to to deal with that. So, having two does is important for to have a foster and breeding two at a time is really helpful. You want to keep your rabbits in production. One of the biggest mistakes that new people make is that they overfeed their rabbit. And rabbits put on weight really easily. And once they get that internal fat, they won't breed anymore. And it's very difficult to, you know, bunny calisthenics is, you know, sort of hard to do. <laughs> Enough bunny calisthenics to get that weight off. So really you want to keep that feed. And we can talk about feed for a minute. Many people do not want to buy rabbit pellets for good reasons, right? The, the cost keeps going up. It's a hassle sometimes, our supplies, and you can't just switch out feed one day to the next. You need to kind of transition them. A good breeder will give you some food when you get the rabbit. I also give people water. We're all It's all about reducing stress in our stock. But, um, so, and we, I have a couple of books here about feeding on, on if you want to do your own food for rabbits beyond the pellet. This one is a favorite for me as a historian because it was written around World War II when people, when everything was rationed, all grain was rationed. So people had to figure out how to, but they really wanted people in Italy, under the fascists, it was even required to raise rabbits. People were required to because it's such a practical protein. So people needed to raise rabbits for the war effort, um, but they had no grain. 
so how to feed them so I'll have these books out you guys can take pictures and stuff so I, I'm not there's lots of good ways to raise stock so it's not that there's just one way I'm going to talk to you mostly about the, the way um, that I do it and the way I recommend people to do it but it's not the only way to do stuff just like there's lots of wonderful breeds there's not just one breed so generally with the pellets you want to avoid pellets that have a lot of corn I initially started with feed from my feed store and I got a lot of bloat in those newly weaned kits and a lot of death. I mean, basically a sick rabbit is pretty much a dead rabbit. They're very, they're just very fragile little critters. And so you really wanna, you wanna watch out for, for anything that's got much corn in it because it's too much sugar. Basically it's too, it's too rich for their system. Other than that, there's a lot of perfectly fine things that you can use and you don't have to stress about that too much. Um, hey this is a great basic rabbit book but he it needs to be updated he says oh you've got to have hay but you don't most pellets now have enough fiber he also says give routine antibiotics no nobody ever gives animals or people routine antibiotics anymore that's why we're being restricted from access because people were doing following old advice like this so basically a good pellet sure you can give treats if you want to be careful to keep my does from gaining that weight that will make them useless as breeders, I don't start giving them full feed until their babies are 10 days old, which is basically when their eyes open and they come out of the nest box. Because I don't, I'm watching the boat doe's body or in her behavior. If she's looking desperately hungry when I come, then I'm gonna give her a little bit more. If she starts looking a little thinner, I'm gonna give her more. So you're watching her, but you don't need to feel like you need to stuff her. When those babies are 10 days old and they're start gonna, they've been munching on the hay in the nest box, they're gonna start to learn to eat pellets, then everybody gets as much feed as they'll eat. Until, and, and that's for rabbits until they're six months, until they're grown. How long do you keep the babies and the mom together? Well, that's another thing that can vary and that you have a lot of latitude. Some people, some commercial rabbit trees, these guys uh, in Kansas here, they, they wean at four weeks. I find that that's very stressful for my kids. So even though they would survive without her, I don't. I want to reduce stress, and so I tend to go later than that. So it's weeks, not days. Right. Because I thought the mom would like bump it or something. Like smack, like some of them get, some breeds get angry and they like hit them. Not, not generally. I mean, I mean, occasionally you will find freaks. When when a doe hurts her kids, it's often because she's stressed. Like maybe there's been a lot of like the neighbor's dogs came around and were barking right on them all the time or okay. and a stressed doe will kill her young. So if, if she's doing that, it's generally not that she's bad. It's generally that she's stressed. Uh, people, when kids get out of the nest box, people are like, oh, she threw them out. They don't have that capacity. They're not cats. So they can't pick them up and move them around. That's why they can't put them back if they do fall out. Rabbits can sometimes hang on too hard to the nipple and they get dragged out. And then if they get hypothermia, sometimes it helps if you have a chest, but you can you can tuck them away and warm them up. They say it's not dead until it's warm and dead, but it's hard. It's really hard, but you can. And once they go into a, a state of hypothermia, you can bring them, it's possible to bring them back, but don't beat yourself up if it doesn't really work out. No, they're probably fine. I mean, really, you want to, you need to think about separating the different kits. Like these guys are nine, nearly ten weeks old, and they're still fine. Once they get to be about ten weeks old, the bucks will fight to the death, and then that's when also breeding might start. On in the breeding that you're not really kind of controlling for. The the sisters can stay together for a long time, but if you like, say you weren't on top of your schedule and you did the process and you've got some 12 week old, you're gonna to need to separate the, the bucks away. And into, so let's, we didn't talk about housing yet, but housing, it's really helpful to have, like uh, Chase talked about quarantine, it's helpful to have cages like this with a tray in them that you can put someplace else, have something like that for, for sickies or for quarantine, for new animals. It's helpful to have a few like two by two cages, like small ones that you can kind of, when you need to separate them out. Otherwise, what you need is pretty much, I mostly recommend hanging wire cages, suspended wire cages, about 30 by 36 or 30 by 30 for each doe of the regular sized breeders. 
when it's those like Florida whites, you can go to like 24 by 30 or a little bit smaller and they're quite comfortable. And a buck shirt, it's nice. He, if 24 by 30, but it's nice 30 by 30, 30 by 36, that's nice, but he'll be fine in something like 24 by 30. Um, it's nice to have two big cages per doe because then when you wean, you can move the doe, which is less stressful for the kids than moving them. So it's all about reducing stress on those babies so that they're, um, Okay, so it's about reducing stress on those babies. So that's um, the I think really nice housing for an outdoor rabbitry is a hanging wood a wood frame that you can hang the cages from. I use a lot of carabiner clips so I can take them down and change them around or hose them out. Uh, a little bit of space and then a roof, and then if you can put that under deeper shade like a really deep tree canopy or like a carport, then for the summertime you don't want any light to hit them. In the summer, you want lots of air and and no sunshine. You Why want lots that? of heat. Huh? Why no sunshine? Because they overheat very easily. They overheat, and then uh, if if you're raising a breed that you want to show, they'll also kind of bleach out with the sun. So mostly, they just can't handle the, the, the heat. So you you really want to keep them in that deep shade if it's if you have an outdoor rabbitry. Then indoor rabbitry, we talked about those lovely pole barns just don't have enough air. You need lots of air. You need to move the hot air out above. You need to move air underneath your cages so that you're getting the ammonia out from their urine. Can I ask you a question? Sure. My daughter has raises rabbits and she's in Maryland. They need a natural outdoor where they dug down, put fencing down right. in, put dirt back, but then they can burrow naturally. Right. So let's talk about that. Is that, that. Okay? Let's, let's talk about the colony setup. There are many, many people do a colony setup. Many people do tractors and they have they, they put their grow outs on, on grass and so forth. The the reason that um and you can do that and there's lots of good resources. The reason oh is that the rabbits? That's how Oh awesome so great. I'm so excited that he's a smoking rabbit for us today. Yeah. So Here's the problem, and this goes back to Chase's biosecurity talk, that um, coccidiosis is going to be a huge, huge problem, and that's the number one killer of your, your kids when you're weaning them is coccidiosis, which is a horrible death of bloat and mucus, and it's really painful for them. So that's a problem with being on the ground and being in. Um, also, if you want to raise to have show, you need to know who the mom and the daddy were. And if you have them in a group setting, it's very difficult. I've seen people with a really big cage and two does that were like sisters or mother daughter and it can be kind of neat for them to have that kind of social interaction but they're pretty solitary animals they're not like suffering horribly especially if you pay some attention to the, your breeders you get to know your breeders you know like you won't you won't you don't need to get to know all the babies because then it, life is easier for you if you don't get to know them well but get to know your breeders and watch them and so forth the other big disease issue is something called rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which was brought to us, thank, thank you, China. Frozen Chinese meat was brought in through Mexico and brought this disease where they just bleed to death. So it's basically, it's basically devastated the rabbit population in Australia. It is here. So uh, two years ago when they had the national convention in Louisville, there was a, a case detected. And so nobody, they stopped all other shows here in Indiana, a hundred mile radius around the outbreak. And so it's here in our wild rabbit population, mostly because of people putting rabbits on the ground and spreading it. And so when, if you get it, all your rabbits are dead. And if they're not, then they're wonderful genetics and maybe you'll save the planet because your rabbits lived. But it's a terrible disease. And the main reason they, they won't keep, they'll cancel shows in an infected area is because we transmit it on the cages, the cars, our clothes, so we can transmit it. They said, don't worry about it. Like if you, if you don't have it, you don't have it, right? It's, it's, that, it's that it's really easy to transmit. So there's things like that that mean that, um, you, don't, that you, wanna, you wanna be very intentional if you decide to use the ground with rabbits. The other thing is rabbit liver is an incredible delicacy and so helpful and it's really, really mild. And it coccidiosis, you can't eat the livers. If they've got coccidiosis, you'll see because there'll be white spots all over the livers. I sell the livers eight ounces for ten dollars wholesale for rabbit liver. It's a huge delicacy. So for me, it's really important to keep everything clean because that's a that affects my bottom line in terms of, of meat sales. Oh, let's talk about that a minute here. If you guys are, are you guys doing okay? 
Okay, so we are so lucky. Those, those, anybody coming up from Kentucky? Okay, I don't know the rules in Kentucky. So, but in Indiana, you can sell rabbit meat fresh or frozen at your farm. You can take frozen rabbit meat anywhere and sell it directly to your customers. You may be in a county where the farmer's markets are required to only have inspected processed meat. But if you're not, you're very lucky. And if you want to sell in a retail space or to a restaurant, it has to be state inspected. There's one, one, one place I know of in Indiana and it's in Cambridge City, east of Indy. So I drive two hours there every month and I have to coordinate with other rabbit producers to have enough rabbits. So if you do this, you'll talk to me about it anyway because we'll have to coordinate processing. And I process there with them. Um, Indiana, the other thing I'd like to change is that the state pays the inspection fee for chicken, but not rabbit. Other states like Illinois, they pay for rabbit too. So there's no reason we couldn't have that to have a really good rabbit industry in Indiana. We can make some simple changes and uh, be able to really do something we're small producers. Rabbits, one of the reasons they didn't, every ethnic group in the US had rabbit in their cuisine. Up until, um, well, even I knew people in the suburbs of, like, that had um, a rabbit hutch for their family. They had a big garden and a rabbit hutch. It was such an important part of American culture until Big Ag said, nope, it's gonna be chicken, pork, and beef, and that's it. And then people's diets got really narrow. The kind of meats that they're used to eating, the variety of vegetables and meats got really narrow. And so I really feel strongly that it's a part of American culture we wanna bring back. And, um, and it's something also that thanks, thanks to our big immigrant population, they never stopped eating rabbit, and so they're interested in eating rabbit. So there's lots of, there's lots of possibilities for rabbit in Indiana and also for rabbit as a, as a really important part of our, our food cultures in, a, in America. It's an excellent, um, excellent source of protein. It's something that you as a homesteader, it's a very practical meat to raise. You can raise it year round. You don't have to have big facilities. Um, as to sell the rabbit, it's one of the most expensive meats a restaurant could decide to serve because it takes a lot of work to raise a rabbit. You, at, on my farm, it's the most labor intensive stock. After rabbits come goats, which are, who are trouble, goats are trouble, then come sheep and then come cattle in terms of amount of, of work and labor it takes. Um, they've, the big boys, they wanna, they tried having people um, throw rabbits in a big shed on the floor. They just died. So rabbits are really, rabbits say no, you know, you treat us right and we'll, we'll be great, but they just don't do well under industrial production. Um, yeah. Okay, so typically you're gonna you're gonna process not really earlier than five five pounds is the target weight, and your rabbit should be getting there around ten weeks. If it's like a Florida white, it would be maybe more like twelve weeks. Now it tastes perfect. That's what they call fryers. It tastes perfectly lovely if you wait till sixteen weeks or more, sixteen twenty weeks. If you want to do the pelts, you're gonna wait till sixteen weeks because the the skin isn't thick enough to tan until then. So you're gonna wait a little longer, but it's gonna be really love. It's gonna be lovely to eat. Fix it in a. Um, you want to be gentle. Um, it can be great grilled, but you have to watch because it has so little fat. Generally, if you make rabbit sausage, generally people add a little bit of like pork fat or something else. Yeah. Labor intensive. Is that because of the cleaning of the cages and keeping them cool in summer? Or? Yeah, things like that. Like it's um. Uh, yeah, it's labor into I mean, even if even if you do like a colony method, you still gotta watch them and look after them and um, and so forth. So it just, you know, they're they're vulnerable to predators. So you well, have I to have, have a one, and I want to get into, but yeah. I've, I've been holding back because I don't, you know, I don't want to jump in before okay. I know what I'm doing. Well, I think I have two questions. One is like, when do you process, and then and then how much work? So rabbits are something that if you've got like, say you have a day job, you know, you have a forty hour a week day job. You could do rabbits if you have everything set up and you're feeding like pellets and that instead of like forage. Like if you do that, you need a lot of time. You can you can pretty much look at them and you know check them over and feed them really quickly. So that's like your five minute thing. And then you know and then once a week you're going in and that's there. That's even if you have lots of rabbits. 
it really doesn't take that long. Well, we have like 200 rabbits, right. so it takes like an hour to like okay. go. But that's if you're going. That's, that's if you're going fast. So it's no, it's not. It's not bad, and you can do things like automatic waterers. You know, I, I, we're gonna set up an automatic watering system, but right now I use secondhand Pyrex because it, you can, it can freeze and not break, and it can go in the dishwasher, and it's. So I just go to, I just, I just haunt Goodwill and buy all the secondhand Pyrex I can get. So you can use that. You can use the automatic uh, J feeders, and so you're, you really, you know, uh, as Chase said, you want to look at them, see how they're doing, run your hand over their back. Do they, do they, are they feeling too thin? Are they, are they seeming fine? looking for the ear bites so you just want to kind of check your stock but they on a day-to-day -day basis it's not crazy but it's not like a cow where you just kind of put them out and you're doing the same kind of checking them over but it's yeah it's just not and uh and the predator issues are something to think about you know you don't need to worry about that okay it's like that when you check my third letter i always end up with the kids in the sky yeah, that uh, that kind of that nest box eye thing, and I you just like clean. Acid and water. Is something yeah, acid like keep matter, it. You matter. can keep it clean if you want to get some teramiasin ointment. You can, but often it'll clear up if you clean it out and kind of watch. You just want to make sure that they're not. If they're a little bit older, it could be because they started to fight. So if you're seeing that, if you're seeing that little ones, they just call it nest box eye. You want to keep that nest box pretty clean, and that's why you don't. Once their eyes open in about 10 days, you're taking the nest box out. You know, if it's if it's winter and I want to give them a little cozy spot, maybe I'll change it and clean it and put it back in. But otherwise, you want it because you don't because you want to keep the bacteria down, so you don't leave the nest box. Like well, pink eye, yeah, yeah, but it's like maybe mine. It's much milder. Yeah, that that that, that nest box eye. I would say like, yeah, if you if you clean, keep it clean, it should clear up. But as I said, the, the, if you if you see a rabbit who stopped eating, immediately take away all anything but hay and water. You can crush up some tums and like some berry flavored tums in the water if you want to to kind of try to soothe them a little bit. You can put some probiotic in it if you want to in the water. But you just really want to kind of remove variables and make that digestive system calm down. It's very hard if you have a rabbit who gets that gets bloat. It's really hard to save it. Sometimes I've I've, I've managed to massage the stuff out, the mucus out, and sometimes they'll live, but it's really hard. Rabbits are just really fragile, so you just have to get ready for some heartbreak. You know what do they say? Livestock is dead stock. It's sort of it's sort of true. But all of this, and this goes back to the previous talk, comes down to good, clean, keeping things as clean as you can keep them and just paying attention to, to the general environment is your best safeguard to try to keep things alive. Rabbits, there is a vaccine for the hemorrhagic disease, but it's very hard to get. I would only start doing that with my most expensive rabbits if there was a major, major outbreak in my area. But otherwise, there, you don't vaccinate rabbits. You don't, there's no like vet cost to rabbits, by and large. So that's something that's also an advantage, I think, for, for small producers. You're not looking at like, Boy, a cow gets sick, I'm gonna get that bet. You know, because that's a that's a thousand dollars, or if it's one of my highlands, we're talking we're talking big bucks, right? So the nice thing about rabbits is that it's a low entry point in terms of cost for homesteaders. It's something you can do on a tiny, tiny space. Some people I don't recommend it, but they do it in apartments. <laughs> or if you have a big space, you can have a whole building that's a rabbitry and go in for it whole whole rabbit. But um, so I really, if, I'm happy to answer other questions. Um, and certainly if you want stock, I can provide stock for you. Um, but it's been great talking to you guys today. Thank you very much. Thanks. You got a book on uh, walks and uh, rabbit poop. Uh... Yeah, so you can, the rabbit manure, you can raise, some people raise fishworms in them for a second line of income. So yeah, please come look at the books if you want. Come pet the rabbits. We lost some of our kid ac action. Come pet rabbits. You want to pet a rabbit? You should yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm doing I'm pushing the I'm pushing down quite a lot. Right. And kind of stretching. So I can see that what's happening with those with those organs. That that's good. Yeah, and I'll I'll try I can try to talk about it.
Oh yeah. As you can tell, Leslie is very passionate about rabbits and there are multiple byproducts that folks often don't think of when it comes to rabbits. I think she gave a great class and if you guys enjoyed that class, she has offered to come out to our fall event November 4th and give an additional talk. So if there are questions that you would like for her to address in that talk or other topics about rabbit owning that you would like for her to address, just let us know and we'll get that information to her. But again, that'll be November 4th. We are locking down the venue right now. And once we get the venue locked down, we'll start putting out flyers that can be shared regarding the November 4th event. We will always have a spring homesteaders meet and greet last Saturday of April and a fall one the first Saturday of November. If you like what we're doing, like and subscribe to our channel. We'd greatly appreciate it. We're trying to reach 1,000 by Independence Day. 1K by Independence Day is our goal. And as always, y'all, until next time, keep dreaming.